April, uh, February, and then uh -huh. early March. That hopefully everything is fine. Hopefully. <laughs> Good. I see, it's three o'clock now. So, and um, shall we get started? Perfect. Um, so, hello everyone. I see how many of you have logged on already, and others uh, via other channels. Um, I'm very happy to host um, the Source of Sync seminar. Um, as you all know, Paul has done this many times before, and he's asked me and a few other colleagues as well to, to fill in um, a couple of times, uh, so now and also in the future. Um, so my name is Yab Ninas. I'm assistant professor at Utrecht University, and I'm very happy to host this uh, seminar here with Elko Leyendijk talking about groundwater uh, and on a global scale. Um, but before we get started there, and, and before I introduce Elko further, um, also for those of you who don't know yet, um, there is a YouTube channel where you can follow this live stream and also uh, watch any of the talks that have been recorded over the past uh, year. Um, you can follow uh, Paul Lu on uh, Twitter uh, with updates on, uh, on past talks and future talks. Um, and there's also a calendar with, uh, with talks there in the link. Um, next uh, week, uh, at the same, uh, same time as this week on, on Wednesday, 3 p.m. European time, uh, Gary Parker is going to talk uh, about uh, salt water and fresh water uh, mixing and, and how that uh, creates cl uh, clinoforms. Um, very exciting. So please join us again uh, next week and you'll probably see some announcement via email and Twitter as well. Um, okay, so for this week, um, Elko Leyendijk uh, is, is presenting. Elko um, has global interests and you can see that as well in the places that, uh, that he's lived. Um, so he's been a consultant in, in Syria investigating groundwater and dry places uh, and after that, he did his PhD at the VU in, uh, in Amsterdam, um, looking at um, uh, longer time scale, large scale uh, fluid flow. Um, after that, uh, he, he moved to Canada, did a postdoc at McGill, uh, and is since uh, a couple of years a junior year lecturer in, uh, in Göttingen, um, looking, at, uh, looking at groundwater and groundwater models. Uh, and extending that uh, uh, on a big scale. So with that, I'm very happy to, to see this uh, Sources Sync seminar also moving uh, a little bit away from rivers, looking at other very important flow across the Earth's surface. Uh, so with that, um, Elko, if you'd like to share your screen. If you yeah, thank you. I'll stop sharing. Zoom. Well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah. And uh, thanks for hosting this talk, uh, Paul, as well, and, and inviting me. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited. It's uh, kind of a new group of people I'm interfacing here with, I, I think. So uh, there haven't been that many talks on groundwater related issues. And um, but yeah, I've went through the, the, the YouTube list, of course, and there's lots of exciting, there were lots of exciting talks and I hope you, you will like this one as well. So yeah, today I will talk about um, some work we've done on global uh, coastal groundwater discharge. And that was uh, work that we've published in a paper last year, uh, just before Corona got started, it was published. And so um, yeah, I haven't had much in, in person, feedback on that, but I'll be happy to discuss uh, this paper with you. And um, so I'll first discuss some results, but I also want to mention my, my co-authors here. So um, this work was actually started when a uh, long time ago when I was a postdoc at McGill University with Tom Gleason, who's since moved to the West Coast of Canada. And um, we've also worked a lot uh, um, with Niels Moosdorf, who is in Bremen and in Kiel in Germany. So. I actually moved uh, quite recently to a research institute in Germany. So it's called uh, BGE or Federal Company for Radioactive Waste Disposal. So um, yeah, so that's a bit more on my work uh, on deep groundwater flow, but uh, 
um, what I'm doing there. So um, yeah, um, yeah. So let's get started with the presentation. Uh, I thought I first introduce maybe uh, coastal groundwater discharge very basically. Um, so what we're concerned with is the discharge of uh, fresh groundwater or uh, recirculated seawater at the coast. And it's often a mix of both. Um, and we've lumped everything in a term coastal groundwater discharge. Um, so the coastal groundwater discharge uh, can be both terrestrial and submarine. And um, this sort of line of research is often called submarine groundwater discharge because the submarine part is really in the focus. But later on this talk, it will become clear that it's not always easy to separate the submarine and the terrestrial part. Um, so the reason why we're interested in groundwater discharge, in, in submarine groundwater discharge and coastal groundwater discharge is that um, groundwater typically has relatively high solid loads and can, of course, also uh, carry pollutants. So um, those may have a strong effect on coastal hydrology and especially ecosystems. Um, if you look a little bit at the history of the research on this, um, then the, um, yeah, this topic wasn't really much on the picture until the 80s or so. And on the lower figure at the blue bars, you see the number of publications increasing exponentially. And we'll see, uh, perhaps, it, perhaps it's peaked uh, at around 2010, but uh, who knows? I mean, there's still about 800 papers per year being published on this topic, which is a pretty huge amount. So this was also a bit unknown to me before I got into the field, but it's a very, very active and blossoming and interesting research field. Um, so why is it so popular? Well, uh, Coastal groundwater discharge can have several impacts. Um, the first one is very basic. It also may be the least um, directly exciting. Uh, well, I should be careful there, I guess, but uh, it can uh, impact coastal hydrogeology. So it can be potentially even a buffer. If you start pumping, you will first deplete coastal groundwater discharge, and then uh, it will um, yeah, trigger saltwater intrusions and other issues. So. Um, and one interesting thing that uh, Niels Mosdorf, one of the co-authors, published a paper on is that uh, submarine grounded discharge can be a uh, water resource, and it's actually used in many places around the world. It's obviously not a, a very mainstream water source, but there are many tidal and uh, submarine springs that are being used by different uh, populations around the world. Um, but I guess the main motivation here to study this is the potential nutrients and solutes and pollutants carried by groundwater. And so there have been many, many publications looking at this. And so in extreme cases, um, there's always a lot of uncertainty, but uh, perhaps these uh, algal blooms uh, around the west coast of Florida may be at least uh, not completely triggered, but at least modified by uh, nutrients carried by groundwater. And so those are obviously uh, serious issues. And, and also the issue is that any pollutant that is uh, on land enters the uh, coastal uh, groundwater system, it may uh, reappear uh, in the sea and that can be harmful for coastal ecosystems, of course. So, um, so that's a big motivation behind these research fields and also behind our study. Um, so a very brief thing is that a uh, brief introduction into how, what do we know about submarine groundwater discharge and coastal groundwater discharge? Um, well, most of the studies so far have been uh, field studies where uh, people have tried to measure um, coastal groundwater discharge with various techniques. So you can use coastal um, seepage meters and those would be very point-like measurements. Um, you can also look at various isotopes and tracers to get a little bit more regional estimates. And so, um, so there, uh, most of the publications, I would say, of, these, of this large number of publications have been on these uh, measurements. Um, there are some issues if we want to scale up these uh, measurement data. So all of these measurements methods have their own uncertainties. Um, it's often difficult to uh, separate fresh and saline water inputs. Uh, you have to often estimate some end member concentrations for tracers. 
Um, the variability of uh, discharge may be very high, but then if you have a lot of point measurements, that may be uh, difficult to scale up your estimate. And there's something that we think is maybe also be occurring. There may be uh, some kind of selection and publication bias. So um, yeah, um, later on I'll show some results that the average fluxes that we expect are very low and they're really around the edge of what you can still measure. So we suspect that most published studies are at favor favorable sites. And, and it's kind of logical perhaps because First, you go to a site where you expect submarine ground and discharge to be important uh, or to cause pollution and so on. And then again, yeah, you also don't want yourself to spend a few years or have a PhD student uh, spend a few years and come up with uh, basically zero measurements. So, so that may be a little bit of a bias in the literature, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, we're also interested in, in looking at things at a global scale, um, basically because we feel that was somewhat missing from the picture. Um, if you look at this, um, at uh, the figure on the top left there, so that's um, a publication from the early 2000s with a sort of global water balance and overview. And uh, what is sort of missing from this uh, figure is this arrow there that goes from the land to the sea. So the transfer, direct transfer of groundwater from land into the ocean. So that's um, at least in the early 2000s was still a sort of an unknown factor that didn't really make it to review papers. Um, at the bottom, you see a, a sort of a selected number of papers with a, um, yeah, with potentially large impacts of suffering groundwater discharge on the ocean. So on different, um, fluxes and different solids. So um, there have been a series of papers that have claimed that groundwater discharge may actually be the dominant input for many solids and isotopes into the global oceans. However, if you look at the literature, the um, estimates of how much coastal groundwater discharge there is uh, vary a lot from 0.01% to over 10%. And I would say perhaps with a somewhat downward trend over time. Those are all estimates based on um, upscaling of measurements uh, and field data, uh, which has some issues that we've, we've discussed before. And so the state of the science when we started this at least was that there were no global model estimates yet. And so, yeah. That sort of motivated our attempt. So we sort of optimistically said, why not make a global model uh, or a model-based estimate? And so to make the presentation really short, uh, we uh, we set out to do this. Uh, I first thought, oh, that's not going to be too hard. So be done in a couple of months and can do some other stuff. But uh, those month, months magically turned into several years, actually. Um, uh, the way things go, but uh, we managed to to get uh, to get the models done and and to to calculate a global estimate, and those were published last year in a paper in Nature Communications. And if you would be interested to look up what kind of estimates there are for your particular study area, or so the um, results have been published on Pangea as well, so the the actual data, um, and you can do download those for free. Um, so how do we go about uh, calculating a global estimate of uh, coastal groundwater discharge? Well, the first motivation basically to start this um, was that there are now a lot of global um, hydrogeological data sets that sort of cover the parameters that we need. So coastal groundwater discharge is uh, at the first order, at least an, a function of groundwater recharge. So how much groundwater do you add to? coastal aquifers and the hydraulic gradients in those aquifers and the permeability of the sediments or the rocks that make up the coastal aquifer. Um, so, and basically in the figures you see that we have some data sets for, for all of these variables. Um, they have their uncertainties and they're not perfect, but at least we could we thought we could use them for a first order estimate of coastal groundwater discharge. So that was sort of the motivation. 
And the question is, how do we actually use those data? Um, well, so I'm mostly a numerical modeler as sort of my, the, my favorite tool in the geosciences. And so, of course, the Modeler 3 is a full three-dimensional or four-dimensional, you should say, model of the entire world at high resolution, of course. Um, but um, yeah, for modeling coastal ground discharge, that vision is maybe still, um, yeah, in somewhere in the future. We'll see if that comes or not, because um, modeling um, ground flow in coastal areas is kind of numerically in intensive uh, or demanding because of these differences in salinity and density that you have. And then the um, fresh saltwater interface really needs to be resolved with grid cells at a meter scale. So you can imagine that a three-dimensional model of a continent or the globe even would be quickly become uh, quite unfeasible. So the solution that we've come up with um, is not to make a three-dimensional model, but to make a whole series of two-dimensional models. So two-dimensional cross-sectional models through aquifers. And we take the most important parameters and vary those. So we get a pretty good view and, 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 a, and a, say a set of model results for how coastal grounder discharge reacts to changes in recharge, in permeability, and in topography as well. Um, and then the second step is that we combine this set of models with um, um, these um, compilations of global hydro hydrogeological data of coastal aquifers. Um, yeah, and sort of as a side note, because uh, this project was started a long time ago, um, and then this method of combining two-dimensional cross-section models and uh, and geospatial data sets, I think, has some promise in maybe uh, other areas of hydrogeology or even new processes that we can't resolve fully in 3D. And so we've also used this, uh, for instance, in estimating the amount of young groundwater on the globe. Uh, so models of groundwater age are uh, somewhat less demanding as these models that I'll show you, but also still complex enough that will. Um, yeah, they're much easier resolved on two-dimensional cross-sectional scale. Yeah, so while we got sidetracked with other projects, then um, um, other groups were also not, uh, I guess, had noticed the same uh, gap in our knowledge of um, coastal groundwater discharge. So there were some other uh, large-scale to global estimates um, published in the meantime. And so there was a a group um, by um, in the US um, who published a paper in 2016 in science by um, that used a very uh, nice simple method to estimate submarine ground discharge for the entire US. Um, yeah, so it's it's um, basically a water budget method, and it's basically based on looking at coastal groundwater, um, coastal watersheds, so surface watersheds. And then in identifying those watersheds that don't have um, rivers in them or streams in them. And so, um, and as a first order estimate, they took the ground recharge that is infiltrates in those surface watersheds and assume that that all discharges on the coast. So that's a very simple, attractive method. Um, yeah, to be slightly critical, um, we feel that that this hasn't been entirely validated as this method. So uh, obviously groundwater basins and surface watersheds don't really coincide always. Uh, there may be groundwater discharge on land, seepage, evapotranspiration, and so on. So um, there may actually be something to it, and I'll get back to that later in uh, later slides, but we feel that uh, maybe one or two papers validating this approach would be helpful. I don't know if this group is still working on that. Uh, I hope they are. Uh, that will come, yeah, we'll see. Um, the other approach was also a very impressive paper of the East Coast um, uh, grounded discharge at the East Coast US, and that's shown in the, in the figure on the bottom. Um, and that was a whole series of three-dimensional models, partly overlapping, so a huge amount of, uh, of work, huge effort. 
Um, however, yeah, the, the, the problems of uh, coastal groundwater discharge were also apparent. So this only models freshwater discharge. So it doesn't take into account uh, fresh and saline water and the density differences there. And um, the, the scale at which you can resolve these things in 3D, they use the grid cell size of 250 meters. And so um, that's a skill that becomes a little bit difficult, of course, if you want to resolve processes at the coast that often um, operate on smaller spatial scales. And so back to our own efforts. So uh, what we realized um, somewhere, somewhere early on, we of course looked at existing model tools, but then we're not entirely happy with them. So we had to develop a new uh, model code. Um, it's called Grumpy Cockle, and you can actually download it for free. So it's on uh, GitHub. Um, um, and on the technical details, where I didn't really, um, we borrowed the sort of heavy numerical code from a, uh, a model code called eScript by the University of Queensland. That's also open source. So that's all uh, great that those kind of codes are available. So basically what it does, so you see on the right, uh, the figure here, you see two very simple models. So yeah, I always like to start simple, of course, with these kind of studies. And in, in our study, the model stayed relatively simple. Um, so what you see is a, a two cross sections here through the subsurface, two sloping uh, coastal aquifers with a linear slope. And uh, you see in blue, that's fresh water. And in gray here on the left-hand side, you see saline water. And on the, these top panels, you see small blue triangles. That's where the discharge happens. And so the model was built to, uh, with a sort of realistic representation of grounded discharge. So in technical terms, we use the seepage algorithm. That's not something uh, we invented completely, but we had to adjust it to keep it numerically stable. Um, so what that does, it we in these kind of models, we don't fully resolve uh, surface runoff and evapotranspiration and ponding that can happen at the surface. We sort of approximate it by a simple process, um, but it's still realistic enough that it's uh, and it's robust numerically. Um, so yeah, and so what we have here is it's a closed uh, coastal aquifer, so we have water falling on the top, uh, infiltrating, then flowing to the coast and discharging. So that's how simple uh, as it is, actually. Um, and what we've done then is vary all these parameters. So what you see here is vary the topographic gradient. Oh, so that's obviously a parameter. And the other ones are permeability um, and groundwater recharge, plus a whole host of other parameters. Um, so basically the recipe of how we got to a global estimate from these um, um, set of model runs is shown here. And so it's a bit complicated figure, but uh, on the top right here, you see one of these model runs. And what we've done, we've, uh, I think in total ran 350 model runs with different parameter values. And so those end up in the middle figure where they are all these uh, little squares that you see. And so those on the horizontal and vertical axis, you have a different parameter combination each time. So we have, for instance, recharge volume and topographic gradient. And so, so those squares are um, numerical models with a set of input parameters and a predicted coastal grounded discharge. Now, the other thing is that from our uh, published, and uh, from these published uh, hydrogeological data sets, um, we know at least, or at least we have an estimate of these hydrogeological parameters for each coastal watershed. And we also fed, feed those into the algorithm and they end up in this figure as very small dots. There's so many, of course, you don't see them. There's about uh, 40,000 coastal watersheds around the globe. And now for each coastal watershed, it's located somewhere near a series of model runs in parameter space. And then estimating the coastal grounded discharge for each coastal watershed, you just look to the nearest model runs in parameter space. So the model run with the closest value of permeability or the closest value of recharge, and you do linear interpolation. So that's how we managed to couple these 350 uh, 
groundwater model experiments with this large set of uh, geospatial data for 40,000 coastal watersheds. And that resulted in our estimate of um, coastal groundwater discharge around the globe. And that's shown in the, the, the bottom panel here. Um, yeah, so that's actually the main result of our study here. Um, so before I dive more into discussing the results and the implications and what we've learned of this exercise, um, I first want to sort of uh, highlight why we think our, uh, our method works reasonably well, at least. Um, so if you dive a little bit into the data sets, especially the value of permeability that we use, we use a, a published global permeability map um, that has a very high uncertainty range. Um, so I was expecting our uh, estimates not to be uh, that accurate, actually. Um, however, somewhat to my surprise, if you um, compare the modeled uh, water table gradients with uh, water table gradient data in coastal watersheds, and I've, that's a selection here um, of 300 values, then the two compare reasonably well across a large uh, difference of scales. So, so that gives us some confidence that the model is actually relatively robust. Of course, we still have huge error bars in our um, in our um, estimates, but we feel that we, or at least this figure suggests that we don't make a systematic error actually. So yeah. Then the second thing is um, uh, that we try to compare our model results with uh, uh, some uh, field data. And that was a little bit more difficult because there's just not a whole lot of uh, field data available that really describe a bit more regional picture and over longer time scales. So our model, um, I forgot to discuss this, I think is that it's a steady state model. So we sort of describe the average coastal groundwater discharge over a longer time period. So anyways, uh, to make a long story short, we did select 10 studies. Um, I think we could improve on this in the future. There are more and more studies published every year. So, um, but just as a first flavor, um, our model results have huge error bars. So that you, that's pretty uh, obvious from the figure here on the on the left panel, and that's the result of the uncertainty and permeability. Um, and so each dot is a published. Uh, field study. And for about half of the field uh, studies that we looked at, the values overlap and are reasonably close. So we feel we have, that's sort of, we can be confident in the model there. But um, for the other half, they really don't fit that well. And most of the time, the local field studies overestimate or estimate way more coastal ground the discharge than we do with the model. However, um, there is some reason to doubt um, these field studies uh, in that if you look at the amount of ground recharge into these coastal aquifers, and most of these studies um, estimate the submarine ground discharge that is higher than the amount of recharge in these coastal aquifers. And then I went back to Google Earth and so on and looked at how do these coastal watersheds look? And all of them had coastal streams so this means that the submarine groundwater discharge cannot be the, the entire budget. There needs to be some river discharge as well. So, so there is something going on with, the, with these field studies. And that's actually a known problem that I've discussed also in the introduction slides, that it's just very hard to estimate coastal groundwater discharge purely from field data alone. So, OK, so that said. Um, Let's dive into the results and the implications of what we found out. So our model was relatively simple and um, we used uh, pretty coarse global data, but there's actually a lot of things we can still learn from that uh, for co coastal groundwater discharge. Um, so one thing that we learned is that in most cases, um, groundwater discharge is limited by the flow capacity of coastal aquifers and not by the amount of groundwater recharge into these systems. Um, 
that's a little bit, at least was for me a bit unexpected and perhaps counterintuitive, but what you see here on the lower left panel, you see these, uh, uh, each dot represents a uh, value of coastal grounded discharge, and on the horizontal axis you see grounded recharge. And it basically, if you follow the figure to the right, then um, it basically flatlines. So the more recharge you uh, add, it doesn't mean the more submarine grounded discharge. And that um, basically tells us, or the reason for that is that uh, the amount of water you can discharge at the coast is limited by the permeability of the aquifer. And so the more recharge you add, if you add more recharge, it will not enter, end up at the coast uh, because the flow capacity is limited. What will happen instead, it will discharge somewhere on land. It will perhaps flow to the nearest river or it will generate surface runoff and so on. So, um, yeah, the implication of that is that grounder, coastal grounder discharge is relatively insensitive to climate um, and perhaps also to climate change. Um, but it's very sensitive to permeability and topography, which unfortunately are a little bit poorly uh, or difficult to characterize. Well, at least topography we know, but permeability is often quite uncertain. So that was the first sort of surprising implication. And then the other uh, result is that um, it's a little bit a negative result. So uh, if you remember in the introduction slides, these, these papers that um, made claims that submarine grounded discharge may be a large part of the ocean budget and so on. Uh, our result is kind of the opposite. It's in line with these sort of slight downward trend in the, in the, in the studies. Um, but we estimate that coastal grounded discharge is only 1% or around 1% of the discharge, um, of the amount of water that discharges into the oceans by rivers. So if you compare it to rivers, it's a pretty insignificant um, water source. Uh, the reason for that is already because coastal watersheds are just, or coastal aquifers are just very small and coastal watersheds are also. So rivers, of course, tap the entire continent uh, in some cases even, or large parts of it at least. Um, uh, whereas coastal aquifers are just uh, uh, small, uh, just cover a small spatial area. And then our model experiment shows that even for those small coastal watersheds, even there, most of the water doesn't really end up in, uh, in the coast. So on average, about 10% of the groundwater recharge in coastal aquifers uh, flows towards the coast. And all the rest, it feeds uh, again um, back into rivers. So it, it sustains river base flow. And the implication of that is that it's a low, uh, um, so coastal ground discharge is a pretty low term in, or a small term in, in the um, oceans, water, and solid budgets. So, um, and I think, yeah, I have a slide on that, and that's. We did some very first order calculations. So we have a relatively detailed map of coastal grounded discharge. And what we've done is we've um, went through the literature and um, looked up <clears throat> as, uh, average groundwater concentrations for different uh, elements. Um, and so if you do the calculations, then because of the somewhat higher concentration in groundwater, there is a bit more solid input. Uh, however, it's still not that much. So just around 2%. Maybe if you <clears throat> stretch the uncertainty range, it will be a bit higher, but um, it will probably not be a significant source for the oceans. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit of a negative result. Um, the implication is also that um, there are some studies that measure um, total submarine grounded discharge, which includes uh, freshwater discharge that we focused on, but also includes recirculate, recirculation of seawater. And so there's a bit of history through these studies. So uh, the first model was already published in the 1970s. It's an analytical equation, actually, and estimated that the recirculation of seawater due to uh, waves, tides, and storms uh, could be potentially pretty huge. So it, it's about three to four times as much as the river flux. And in previous versions of my uh, 
presentations. I then added a study in 2014 that used radium isotopes in the ocean. So a compilation of radium isotopes and a model to interpret them and ended up with about the same number. So I felt the two studies were confirming each other and it was a pretty solid case for a huge amount of recirculation of seawater. Um, however, um, um, I was at the presenting at the ASL, ASLO meeting um, this summer and then, um, yeah, uh, Guillaume Legrand uh, from Barcelona, I think, uh, alerted me to uh, two papers that sort of, um, yeah, made the story a little bit more difficult. And um, so there are large uncertainties in these radium isotope estimates, and they show that um, the recirculation of seawater may be much lower, um, although there's still a huge uncertainty range. And then there's uh, methodological issues with the radium isotope method that all of the current studies may overestimate by a factor of two or three. So that was a paper in 2016 by Cho and Kim. Um, yeah, so I'm not fully qualified to talk about these, uh, what, who's right and who's wrong in this field, but the recirculation of seawater may be a lot lower than this, this at least lower than this factor of three to four to, times the river flux. And uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, it is quite likely that most of the submarine ground discharge is still recirculated seawater. So that seems a pretty solid conclusion, even though there's uh, this uncertainty. Um, one other thing that we realized pretty early on in the models, actually, um, if you build the models like we do with a realistic exchange with the surface, um, then it's a little bit unescapable that you feel that coastal ground discharge um, has two components, submarine and terrestrial, and the two are a little bit difficult to separate. So if you look at the figure on the right, you see, again, this modeled sort of triangle, and the elevation of this triangle denotes how much grounded discharge there is. And so there's a component that's on the right of this vertical line that's onshore, and a component on the left that's offshore. So that's the vertical line would be the average coastline. So there is, uh, in this model run, it varies, uh, the, the proportions vary a bit, but uh, there's always, um, almost always at least, both terrestrial and submarine ground at discharge. Um, and the two are very difficult to, to separate. So the literature is really focused on submarine ground at discharge, but the, but the terrestrial part may be as important, actually, if you look at these model results. Uh, it's just, not just a quirk of our model in uh, studies of grounded discharge near lakes and rivers. This has been known that there's a seepage phase. Um, and so if you look at this analytical solution, then you see the same triangle form in uh, onshore and offshore discharge. So the question, what does it mean really? And so question by my one of my or remark by one of my co-authors is, well, if there's a lot of terrestrial discharge everywhere, why don't we see wet beaches everywhere? So yeah, why can you sit on the beach and not be uh, feel that there's groundwater seeping uh, up uh, on your beach towel all the time? So um, yeah, and so yeah, I've tried to done, do some calculations, and it's the thing is that the seepage fluxes are pretty small. So in most of the coastal watersheds or coastal aquifers that we studied. Uh, the terrestrial seepage flux is lower than the potential evapotranspiration. So the seepage you may not see directly, it's just feeding coastal um, vegetation and ecosystems, actually. Um, in a um, smaller uh, amount of cases, this uh, terrestrial seepage flux may actually be higher. However, so in our two-dimensional model world, we don't really resolve coastal streams. We have this sort of artificial a uh, seepage term that exchanges ground and surface water. And what you may or can imagine, and I think you see, is that there may be a, a, a higher groundwater component to um, coastal rivers and stream, and there may actually be a higher stream density the closer you get to the coast. And that's something that, yeah, I think that's an interesting finding. It's a very basic finding. It's 
sort of been hiding in plain sight. Uh, if you look at these figures from the 90s, um, the implications of that in the field are is still something that could be worked on and would be interesting to pursue. So, um, so on the global scale, what we presented was a bit of a negative conclusion um, that if you look at the oceans, then coastal ground dis discharge is not very uh, significant. However, if you look at the variability, then the flux is extremely variable. Uh, so the reason for this is that at high values of permeability and high values of topographic gradient, um, coastal ground discharge can really take over and suddenly become the dominant term in the water flux or the water budget of coastal aquifers. And so, and those values of high values of permeability and topographic gradient do occur in part of the coast. So wherever you have permeable sediments, so uh, like medium to coarse sands, karstic carbonates, et cetera, and you have some topographic gradient, it doesn't have to be much actually more than uh, say one or 2%, then you can have a pretty dominant uh, coastal ground that discharge flux. Um, yeah, we've done the calculations, of course, on our results. So about 10% of the world coastline provides 90% of the ground discharge. So it's very unevenly distributed, very variable and heterogeneous. Um, the implication of that is that if you look at the locations where there is a high um, coastal ground discharge flux, and you look at the locations of um, coastal ecosystems, then still about 20% of the um, coastal ecosystems, like uh, I think we looked at a selection, so estuaries, salt marshes, and coral reefs. So about 20% of those um, have a dominant or an important, not a dominant, an important input by submarine grounded discharge. And we have some uh, not entirely uh, super well justified um, criteria to define important there, but it it is that we define it as submarine grounded discharge or coastal grounded discharge being 25% or more of the, than the river flux um, compared to the river flux and um, being more than uh, 100 cubic meter per, um, God, I should know the units, I guess, uh, cubic meter per year. Yeah. Um, so those are the uh, sort of, criteria that from a little bit of a review of sites with reported impacts of submarine ground the discharge, we feel that that's sort of a limit that we can, or sort of a, um, a limit for the serious impact of submarine ground the discharge. Um, yeah, so um, I guess the good news is that many ecosystems are off the hook, but the bad news is that for 20% of these ecosystems then, uh, we do need to uh, start thinking about suffering ground discharge and the pollutants and uh, nutrients that they potentially carry. Um, thankfully, suffering ground discharge is a, a, a popular study area. However, there's actually many areas that have been poorly studied. So um, a lot of studies are located uh, yeah, in areas like the Mediterranean or the Baltic Sea or the North Sea. And Japan is actually uh, a very uh, strong player in this type of research and the US is too. However, there are many areas around the world where we expect strong impacts, but uh, we don't have really a lot of data. Um, and so, and for monitoring this flux and its impacts, I think it's um, that's also very rare. I mean, most of these field studies are uh, taking a single point in time. So I guess there's still a lot of knowledge gap or so, and we hope our, our study can help with this um, to pinpoint areas that may be vulnerable. Um, so then I feel, yeah, the, the, the research on coastal ground the discharge isn't finished, so we've learned a lot by these relatively simple models still, but there's still a lot to be improved, actually. So, um, yeah, and I feel, I mean, there's this is a little bit of a subjective take on where the field could be moving uh, in terms of model-based estimates. So um, what I haven't really shown that much, but uh, 
is that our models are very sensitive to permeability and the permeability data set is, is great for what it is, but it can definitely be improved on. So it has a high uncertainty, not a whole lot of data points supporting it. And um, there's also a question that our models are really simple. They uh, use a homogeneous geology. And so uh, some recent work out of Utrecht actually uh, came out last year, um, which is pretty, pretty impressive that there's a characterization of geological heterogeneity of coastlines around the world at a global scale. So we could potentially use that into models. And I'm pretty sure the Utrecht group would be, is probably working on that actually. Um, yeah, the other thing is that um, I myself am finalizing a paper on using water level data to quantify permeability and transmissivity um, at large scale. So yeah, we feel we've developed an automated method to to analyze water level data to estimate transmissivity. So um, that's the depth, uh, that's permeability times depth for uh, ab um, about 2,500 points in the in continental US. And we could expand that to other areas and more data sets. So we hope to submit that paper soon. And we feel that that may help to characterize um, permeability and coastal groundwater flow in the future. Um, then on this water budget method, I, I, would, I feel that, yeah, it would be great if we could sort of test the limits. When does it work? When does it not work? So this is this method of using surface water budgets to calculate submarine groundwater discharge. There may be really something to it. Um, however, we have to see when it's applicable and when it's not. So um, yeah, and I've, uh, so this is a shameless plug of some of my other own work is that, um, yeah, I've recently completed a model that couples groundwater flow, overland flow and erosion. And that sort of gives a, a theoretical basis of why drainage density would be uh, depending on um, transmissivity. So that may be, uh, so this, this sort of mechanism may be why this surface water budget may work sometimes. And uh, so that sort of integrating those kind of models and data sets may, may, help, in, may help out with uh, quantifying coastal ground discharge in the future. And then maybe a very sort of philosophical point is that, um, yeah, in this, sort of, in this data field, uh, in this field of study on coastal ground discharge and submarine ground discharge, then field-based studies and database studies are not always that well integrated with models. So I guess and the numerical modelers, I mean, there have been lots of numerical model studies, also case studies. Um, I feel that, yeah, I hope I'm not uh, uh, insulting anybody here, but that the, those uh, fields have been a bit uh, removed from each other. So there's not a whole lot of effort on uh, combining data and models at the same site and looking at, okay, well, if our data upscaling predicts really high fluxes, are they still physically realistic? And vice versa, what does our model predict? Is it consistent with the data? Can we improve the parameterization? So I feel that there's a whole, um, there could be some more effort there. And I hope that that will work out uh, to have better integration of um, coastal grounded discharge research communities there. Yeah. So then, yeah, onto some conclusions that I guess the main conclusions is, um, um, are that coastal ground discharge is mostly controlled by permeability and topographic gradients, so flow capacity. Yeah, and also the finding or sort of confirmation of earlier work that terrestrial and submarine ground discharge are really a continuum. They can't really be separated that much. And I feel that the terrestrial part is a little bit understudied. Um, yeah, and then the fresh ground discharge is uh, actually, if you look at the oceans as a whole, it's insignificant. Um, however, locally, it can be very significant and impact uh, ecosystems uh, and carry pollutants and nutrients to these ecosystems. And so that would be a very important thing to, to get a better grip on in the future. So um, yeah, that was it. And thank you for your attention. And yeah, of course, I'd be happy to take questions. Perfect. Thank you very much, Elko. A lot of food for thought. Uh, any any questions here from uh, 
anyone who's online. Feel free to unmute yourself if you can. Oh, I see, uh, Bernard. Yeah, hi, Alko. I mean, this is uh, really, really important stuff. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, um, in your, in your model, you know, when you look at permeability, uh, particularly in lithologies that have uh, kind of dual porosity, where you have, uh, you know, the the small pores, but then have to deal with fracture flow as well. Uh, how do you incorporate fracture permeability in your permeability model? Ah, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, so I mean, the very short answer is that we don't. So, uh, yeah, so we use a continuum model um, with, uh, yeah, we treat everything as a porous medium and um, we use the values as relatively uh, low values for crystalline rocks. Um, that come out of the global permeability map. And yeah, I mean, it's pretty obvious that these values are very variable depending on yeah, how much fractures you have, if you have to in intersect a fault and so on. Um, however, we sort of ignored that for our global model. I mean, as a, one of the many simplifications. So that would be something to work on in the future too. Yeah. Do, do you think that could contribute to the difference between uh, the field results and the model results in those cases where you find, uh, you know, the few comparisons that have been made, uh, really large disparities between the results of the two, two approaches? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So it may be in some cases, yeah, but for the cases that I looked at, they weren't really in fractured aquifers where uh, I, I would expect something like that. But um, yeah, obviously if you're in a, especially near a fault zone or so that, uh, that is a, a fluid conduit, then your the area where you capture groundwater could be much bigger than the, the coastal watershed or the coastal aquifer itself. So that may drive a lot of uh, STD that our model will not capture at all. Um, and yeah, our models really do sort of averaged coastal grounded discharge over say a coastal, we use coastal watersheds as a spatial unit. Uh, so that's really average over 10 kilometers. So, so, so we don't really resolve locally high fluxes through fault zones and so on. Um, so it's also a little bit of a question of scale, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this this is an incredibly fertile area for research uh, because there's so many open questions and and still pretty large uncertainties uh, that we, we need to deal with. Not only the flux, but also the concentration of the elements that you know, in combination with the flux, um, the water flux contribute to the overall impact on the coastal ocean. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I fully agree there. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, go for it, Paul. Yeah. Uh, Echo, thank you very much for this uh, great talk. It's a tremendous effort. It's very important, as you mentioned, uh, you know, 10 to 15 years ago, most of us only give a subjective description said not too much from uh, groundwater charge, but we have no idea how much percent, 1%, 2%, 5%, or less than one, no idea. But now at least your effort help us understand, you know, quantitatively, we have an estimate. But my question is uh, uh, because we work on the Delta region, Delta have a relatively loose material, silt, sand, sometimes clay, and with also the deltic cloniform uh, stratigraphy. So also lowland area. Suppose there will be a large amount of uh, groundwater will kind of discharge, release to the ocean through the delta groundwater. So what's based on your model globally, uh, the delta region compared the regular coastal region, the, how much more that 
you know, groundwater discharge through the river delta area compared regular like a beach area, like uh, a regular rocky coast. I, I mean, do you have that kind of comparison? Uh, I, yeah, the short answer is I don't. Uh, yeah, I mean, that would be super interesting to calculate, yeah. So our model was relatively simple in that uh, the way we see it's a delta region sort of in our analysis is that it's uh, populated by uh, permeable unconsolidated sediments. So they would be um, have a relatively high coastal ground of the discharge, but then again, the topographic gradient is low. So that sort of dampens it a, it's a little bit, but I would still suspect it's it's relatively dominant. So the hotspots that we mm -hmm. mapped, many of them are in deltas, but I didn't actually, oof, yeah. I didn't look at that in great detail, I have to say. Yeah, yeah. because uh, working on the delta region, somehow we found the potential the groundwater discharge through the delta caused the instability of the delta slope, trigger that kind of landslide because of, the, you know, for example, the Ganges Bomapotra, for example, of the Yellow, Yellow River Delta, because possible the discharge of groundwater caused the weak point of the delta slope. But uh, again, we don't have any quantitative way to define how the how much or how the groundwater flows through there so that's the uh, as uh, bernard mentioned there's definitely lots of potential in that direction very good yeah i agree i mean that would be super interesting yeah i guess another defining thing is that we don't have in our models is the geological heterogeneity and these sloping um uh, sedimentary layers in in deltas that sort of yeah, I mean, there are some studies where you, so in hydrogeology, we call that confined aquifers, where there's a, a clay layer or a poorly permeable layer on top. And that may be pretty common in delta environments, I would say. And that actually may, um, may cause groundwater discharge to be a bit further offshore than, than what we modeled, actually, so potentially. So you could then, yeah, I mean, be a bit further along the shelf and, uh, and, and the things that you mentioned, I've also read a few of those papers. Yeah. That's very interesting that the, so there may be a link to slope instability. Thank you, thank you. So I, I have also a lot of questions. This is really fascinating. But uh, so one of your conclusions here is that your groundwater recharge is not a strong control on the on the groundwater discharge. So is that is there also a relation with drainage density in that if you have if you have increased um, recharge or increased precipitation, you might have higher drainage density. And that's why your groundwater discharge is not as high. Yeah, that's exactly why. Yeah, so yeah, okay. So increased recharge just uh, results in more active surface hydrology, so, and less uh, proportionally less groundwater um, discharge. Yeah. So, and, and if you if you then go and look at drainage density along the coast, you said that you were working on it. I was just curious if you find a strong relationship in in drainage density and groundwater flux. Is that as as a testable kind of metric? Or, or a, the yeah, I mean, the, 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 yeah, that would be interesting to look at. Actually, yeah, I, I, I personally, I don't know uh, many sort of large scale data sets on drainage density. Actually, that are, yeah, I mean, there, yeah, I guess that's sort of out of my normal research field. But I know these sort of uh, global data sets like hydro sets, but they're sort of generated with, um, they're not actual maps of rivers. No, they've been, they've been. Uh, improving that with Landsat, with satellite imagery of rivers. So it's, uh, they're getting oh, to be more and more realistic on like actual rivers versus topographic noise. But yeah. And then I guess the U US coast would be a, a favorable target to test this because there, at least there I know there's, there's, there's actual very detailed maps. So yeah. Yeah. The Dutch coast, unfortunately, is too artificial to test this idea. Yes. At, uh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Don't, don't test your algorithms here. Yeah. Well, and anyone else also questions? Uh, I have one more question. I see it's still one minute before four. So I, I was wondering about the time scale because you, you mentioned tides and storms, but there's like swash dynamics as well. So is, it's, 
is there a limit there? Or is it, does it, does groundwater discharge increase and increase with every narrowing time step we choose for the models? Ah, yeah, so what we've looked at is fresh, so terrestrial groundwater discharge at steady state. So there's actually no uh, transient effects, no waves, no tides and so on in our models. Huh. And so the recirculation would, uh, so there are studies that sort of suggest um, that um, fresh groundwater discharge is not that much affected itself by these transient effects over longer time scales. Of course, recirculation of seawater is, and yeah, I mean, it's sort of on my list as a hobby project, but it's, uh, yeah, I can't really do that in my current uh, job <laughs> to calculate this uh, recirculation. And uh, I mean, it, it's, yeah, it must be doable to get a, a large scale estimate of that as well. Uh, I mean, the time scale, the, sh the shorter the time scale, the shorter the, the infiltration, sort of the part of the seabed that will take part. And also I think the lower the flux, and so, yeah, the, 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 uh, yes, uh, the, the, uh, there is a limit if you choose shorter and shorter time scales. In yeah, the, in the amount time of is very short, you would just infiltrate a millimeter and get back yeah. up, I guess. So, uh, yeah. Cool. Uh, Bernard? Yeah, hi, Alko. I, I can't resist to ask another question uh, on, on much longer time scales, glacial interglacial time scales. So if you're dealing with a very variable sea level, what's the time scale of relaxation of these systems? How quickly do you think they will respond to uh, changes in sea level? Ooh, yeah, there you, um, a good question, yeah. So this was actually, that's another sort of hobby research project that didn't really go forward on <laughs> there. We were interested to look at that and yeah. Um, yeah, what's the relaxation time of these systems? Yeah, I would say they, they, they probably respond relatively quickly. So our average coastal groundwater system there that we use is so has dimensions of something like eight kilometers in land or so. and. Uh, it depends on permeability, of course. So we're looking at the sort of upper active groundwater part that reacts relatively fast. Um, however, I mean, it's known from studies that we do have a fresh groundwater still sitting below the seabed um, wherever it's shielded by low permeable layers. So, um, so if you, so that those were um, either terrestrial or submarine groundwater discharge systems that then get flooded. Um, yeah, so that would be a very long relaxation time uh, that exceeds the time scale of interglacials. Um, yeah, so good. I, I'm not sure if I really answered your question. But it's sort of, it depends on permeability, really. And uh, yeah, for the shallow active ground, the part that would be relatively fast, I would say. Yeah, I'm not sure there's a, there's a good answer to the question, actually. But thanks. Yeah, thanks for, uh, that's yet another interesting angle to study this problem, yeah. I mean, that was actually my original motivation. I was really into sort of geological time scale groundwater flow, and then I went to do this postdoc position. And then, yeah, as you see with this, these results, we never got to the geological time scale part of this project because, yeah, I mean, <laughs> Um, and this was already a pretty huge amount of work, I would say. So, yeah. uh, any other questions? If there are no further questions, I uh, thank you, Alco. Thank you again very much. Uh, I'll hand it back to Paul. I think it did good. <laughs> <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Alco. Okay. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Thanks a lot to, for hosting this and organizing yeah. this. And it's really cool. Yeah. Thanks. That's, that's the key. Keep, keep, in, keep in touch with this community. And uh, the source to sink is not only from the river, but also from groundwater. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, it's definitely uh, integrated. Yeah, that's it. So. To be honest, this is a really unstudied uh, domain. It's, it's maybe not that significant before thought, but uh, still, still, we you know, uh, uh, geochemically, uh, it's very important. <laughs>